We, um, week to week, have been uh, trying to pull something from our doing life together, but because of the seminar and whatnot, I'm not able to get that together this week, but we'll be back next week. Uh, I hope you're going to enjoy the reading that you'll be doing this week as we learn more about King David and how God sh just showed himself in his life in powerful ways. Jeremiah chapter 18 is a passage that many of us are familiar with. I want to start off by saying, have you ever messed up? Or maybe you're one of those that always did it right, never made a mistake, never, never really reached a point where you, you begin to realize, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. You know, you take a misstep, you mess up, and unfortunately, sometimes when we do that, it's not just us that we mess up, it's other people. There's a lot of innocent bystanders that get injured when we choose to sin, and we choose to do our own thing. In fact, the Bible says that all of us are in that condition. I've been studying the book of Romans in our, in our Bible study class, and we haven't quite got here, but yet it says it in a lot of other ways that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It, it is a statement of fact. And so some people think, well, only those that go to church are those that do not sin, or those who have never sinned. And, you know, it just isn't that way, because it is the human condition that we all mess up. So if you're one of those that have a past, I want you to be welcome here today because we've all experienced that. In fact, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 says it this way, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Of course, the Bible pictures this special relationship between a sheep and a shepherd, that Jesus is the good shepherd and we are the... Yeah, the foolish sheep, the neglectful sheep, the sheep that just, for whatever reason, finds itself leading itself away from the shepherd. And I'm so grateful that God goes after us. In fact, this is, this is the experience of the human race all the way back from the beginning. It only takes three chapters, really two chapters, before God tells us the experience of what happened to our parents. That there in the Garden of Eden, it, despite what God had warned them and what God had told them and what God had almost pleaded with them, they chose to go astray. And we find throughout the rest of the scripture, God chasing his wayward creation. But the hound of heaven surely goes after those that he loves. And we see that throughout the, the Old Testament in all of our reading that we have done, that God does not give up on man. Sometimes God allows us to go through difficult times, but that does not mean that God has given up on us. Even when God allowed his people to be taken captive, the city of God to be destroyed, the temple to be destroyed, it wasn't that God had washed his hands of the human race. He just knew this is how it was that he would find a way to bring man back to him. And so throughout the Old Testament, God sends prophet after prophet after prophet pleading with the hearts of the people to come back to God. I don't know where you are this morning in your walk with God, but I suspect most of us would have to admit it's not as close as it could be. It's not as close as even we desire it to be, but here's the truth. It's not as close as God wants it to be. I can't imagine the God of heaven would liken my relationship with him to that of my spouse. My spouse and I are like this. We do life together. We eat together. We work together. We play together. We fuss together. We do all those things, and God wants that kind of a relationship with us. Beloved, I hope that we will get beyond this idea of just coming to visit God once a week. God will never be satisfied with that, and I hope that you won't as well. 
I mean, it's good to come to church. It's good to have this experience. But God wants so much more than that. Well, even in these very difficult times that God allowed his children to go through, God still wanted to reach them. And in many cases, some of us are stubborn and stiff-necked and bullheaded and whatever you want to call it, and it takes those very difficult times in our life for us to finally surrender and realize that, hey, I need to come back to God. I need that experience. So during one of these darkest times, God raises up a man by the name of Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet who had a heart for God. He had a heart for God, but he also had a heart for the people. And and what we find is God's people are in a terrible way. They are in rebellion, and God has allowed certain things to happen, and I can imagine the prophet Jeremiah thinking, this is it. We have pushed our God too far, and will we ever be right with God again? You see, it wasn't that Jeremiah had given up on God. It was like Jeremiah had given up on the people. And he sensed that maybe it was over. All that God had wanted for his people. It was truly a very dark time. I want us to go to Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1. In the midst of that, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. It says the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? And the Lord said, Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you, so are you in my hand. I can't think of a better place to be than in the hands of the potter. Oh, listen, people of God, what God has to say to us this morning. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we... We want to hear from you. We want to hear the words of God. We want the words of God to wash over us. We didn't come this morning just to do penance, just to come here to say that we checked it off the list, that we came to church, but Lord, we want something more. It is not just about attending a service, but we want to experience our God today. We, like Israel, have gone our own way. And it really doesn't matter what kind of week we've had because we know that this is our experience, that we often will stray. We often will do our own thing. We all have those experiences in our life where we wonder, is this all there is? Some of us have been following the Lord for many years and we're asking ourselves, is this all there is or is there something more? I pray tonight, or today, as we go into your word, that you would revitalize us, that you would awaken us, and that you would encourage us this morning, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. It ain't over till it's over. You remember who said that? Yogi Berra. It ain't over till it's over. You know, I don't know how many people have been watching a football game or a baseball game or whatever, and the score becomes so lopsided that, well, now the objective is not to see the end of the game. As far as they're concerned, the game is over. Now it's beating the crowd out of the stadium. And then as they make their way home, only to find out when they get home, it wasn't over. The team they thought had won didn't win because there was a great comeback. Well, I, I, I think that concept is true today. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how, how few days or months or years that you think you have left. I want you to know it isn't over. As long as you have life and strength and breath and you have the ability to breathe and to walk and to live, God is not done with you. 
I, you know, I, I know how it is sometimes. We, we tend to think that the history of our life, the plane of our life, the direction, the momentum of our life is what's going to determine our future, but that is not true. You know why? Because God can get a hold of you. God can have his way with you. If we are willing to yield ourselves to God, there is no telling what God can do. Look, I stand before you a middle aged man. That's optimistic. Let me say it this way. I stand before you a person who recognizes that most of their life is behind them. Would that be fair to say? And many of you are in the same boat. Most of your life is behind you. Most, you're never going to be any stronger, never going to be any prettier, never going to be any more, you know, vital than you are today. In fact, for some of us, well, we're already going down the hill. And for those that have gone before me, they say, it just speeds up. That's all that happens. You just get going faster and faster and faster. And, and even though I recognize that, I, I believe with all my heart my des- best days are ahead. I believe that because I have read the Bible, and I believe what the Bible says. You know, many of us, as I said, we give up on things. We suffer. You know, you go to work every day and you think it's never going to get any better. You struggle with those kids of yours and they seem to make the same mistake again and again and it seems like the more you try, the worse it gets. Some of you are in a marriage relationship and it seems like the harder you try to fix your marriage, the more difficult it becomes. And so we give up. We check out. We figure, well, the best is behind us. That isn't always true. You know that, right? For the Christian, the best is always ahead of us. You know why? Because Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 3, there are three reasons I want to share with you why you can be optimistic this morning. Jeremiah chapter, th- chapter 18, verse 3, this prophet of God that had given up on the people of God, maybe he had even given up on God in that sense. He was discouraged. He never thought it would get any better. God sent word to him and told him to go to the potter's house. And it says that I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. Obviously, in this story, the potter represents the father. And so, friends, I want you to know this morning that the potter is at the wheel. The God is at work. The God is at the wheel, and you are that clay. That God is working, God has been working, and God will continue to work until he looks down and he sees what it is that he has envisioned in his heart and mind for you. God wanted Jeremiah to know the potter was at the wheel. You see, sometimes we look at life and we don't see God working. We see the circumstances of life, we see the difficulties, and we almost become overwhelmed. We think our life is out of control. But I want you to know that if you've committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are surrendered to him, if you are following Jesus, your life is not out of control. The potter is at the wheel. I don't know if you've ever seen them do their work. It's fascinating. But you know what? It takes a long time for the lump not to be a lump. Especially when the clay is hard and cold. It has to be rubbed and pushed and stretched and stressed and all of those things. What God is saying in this passage and what I want you to know, that God is in control. We turn on our television and we hear about riots. We turn on our television and we hear a thousand people perished around the other side of the world. You know what? Those things happen all the time. I wish I could say to you that it's going to get better. But we know that sin is killing this world. That sin is causing the chaos that God said a long time ago. It may not have been immediately obvious when Adam and Eve sinned, but when sin runs its course, we see what happens. 
We want to make sense of this world, and it won't make sense. You just can't make sense of sin. And because sin reigns in this world, friends, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And you might be tempted to think, I am out of control. This world is out of control. But God wants you to know the potter is at the wheel. He's sitting at the wheel of your life. He's looking down upon you. And what a comforting thought to know his hands are wrapped around you. I love that. He's shaping us. He's molding us. He's making us into the people we're capable of being. You know, there's a story over in Greenland. You know, the icy waters of Greenland are filled with icebergs. Some big, some small. And, it, and it's interesting as you look out there and you see, because something very interesting can be observed. It seems as though some icebergs move this way and others move this way. And you can't really tell what's going on because most of the icebergs are below the surface. But what you find upon closer examination is that the little icebergs are, are influenced by the winds. And by the, the blowing of the wind, it pushes them in the direction of the wind. It seems like they are at the mercy of that. But then as you look at the bigger icebergs, the one where most of their mass is under the water, they're moving in a way that's contrary to the wind. And of course, we know there's those deep ocean currents that drive those big icebergs. I, I think that's what the Christian life is like. While everybody is being blown this way and that way, for the Christian that has that deep experience with God, the current of our life takes us in a different direction. That even though it looks like the storms are raging and that we might be at the mercy of the storm, God has a way to move us in the direction of the will of his life, or the will of our life. And so, friends, I just want to encourage you this morning that the potter is at the wheel. Second thing that I believe uh, Jeremiah was shown that can be an encouragement to us and maybe a realization to us as well, and that is that sometimes life doesn't turn out the way we think. Here's a revelation for you. Sometimes your life doesn't turn out the way you want and sometimes your life isn't the way God wants. Do you know that? God, God's, well, it's just, it. so, but, but here's the good news. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but here's the good news. It doesn't matter the condition of the clay. That God has a way. Well, here's point number two. He can transform a mistake into a masterpiece. That's the good news of the gospel. That's why... There is no one beyond the grip of the gospel that we can't say, it doesn't matter what your life has been. It doesn't matter the mistakes that you made. It doesn't matter the past that you bring to the foot of the cross. God can do something. God never looks at somebody and says, you're too far gone. You know, I just, I just can't bring good out of that situation. God has a way of looking through all of the faults, all of the baggage that we have of life, and he can see something within us. And God begins to go about transforming us. That's what verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 4 says. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. I have news to you, news for you. When you give yourself to the master, you're not perfect. Too many people think, well, when I get my life cleaned up, that's when I'll turn my life over to Jesus. It doesn't work that way. He's the one that can make things work in your life. He is the one that can begin to make you into something that's even acceptable. And so the clay is marred in the hands of the potter, but I need you to understand that is what it is that God does best. That God can look beyond those things that have marred our life. Not everything that happens in life is by the design of God. You know that, right? 
There's some people that have this idea, even within the people of the church, there are things that happen in my life that are not the will of God, that are beyond my control. I, I've heard people say, you know, things that are, almost seem callous. You got cancer. Well, I guess it was God's will. You know, it's, it's the way we explain everything. Your wife went off and left you. Well, I guess it was God's will. Somebody died. I guess it was God's will. And somehow we, we, we think we take comfort in that. But we live in a world where not everybody does God's will. And because of that, not everything that happens in life is of God's will. Now, we know there's a universal will of God that will not be defeated, but in our lives there are things that happen. Some of you have suffered horrible things in your life. And I don't want to be tripe and say, well, I guess it was God's will. Some of that we have brought on ourselves, And some of it has been brought upon us by others. You and I need to understand that our sin doesn't just affect us. Our sin affects other people. There are always innocent people involved, and we need to understand that. But understand this. There are things for the Christian that happen in our life outside the will of God. But that shouldn't send us into a tailspin because even though it might happen outside the will of God, God has a unique ability to take things outside his will and to bring good from them. No one is beyond that power. I love the text in Romans 8 and verse 28. I don't know if I gave that one to you guys. Do you have that one, Romans 8, 28? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I can't tell you the number of times I've had to read that. I can't tell you the number of times that in, in working with other people, I'm left without words. And all I can do is to point them to this promise. And it, it's hard to believe in the wake of some of the human tragedy that we have to experience that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. How can that be? How could that possibly be? How could we ever claim a promise like that when our hearts are broken, when we've been betrayed, when we are hurt, when we are suffering great loss? How could that ever be? Because the potter is still at the wheel. Don't judge the work of God in your life until he is done. And the promise of God is that he will bring good from that. The marred clay, these experiences may not be God's will for your life, but God can redesign. I'm convinced that sometimes in life, because of the experience of others and the, and the courses that we've taken in life and the time that has passed, sometimes God's ultimate plan for our life cannot be fulfilled. That God may have wanted certain things to happen. And because of choices that we've made, we can no longer experience that. But that does not mean that God cannot transform you into something else. Just like that marred clay when it can't be shaped into one thing, that doesn't mean God can't shape it into something else. Just like that potter. The promise of God is that he can take that marred clay and he can do something exciting with it. So don't give up on your future. You may be sitting here saying, well, but you don't understand. You're right, I don't. But God does. God sees in every person the potential of what could become. God's an artist. God's creative. I'm not that way. I look at a lump of clay and I see a lump of clay. That's all. And even after I work with it a while, I still see a lump of clay. You know, my, the extent of my artistic ability was in fourth grade when I did that macaroni art, you know, and glued it onto the sheet of construction paper and uh, it was so bad, my mom wouldn't even hang it on the refrigerator. <laughs> I'm not that way, but God sees what can happen in your future. God will not give up 
in your life. God won't give up. That's, the, that's his promise. But God can always bring something good. Do you believe that this morning? I hope you do. Here's number three. God will shape your future if you're willing to be the clay. What I find is that oftentimes I defeat God's purpose in my own life. That as much as I say that I'm willing and as much as I say that I want God's will to be done in my life, I still find myself resisting it. Oh, not in open rebellion, you know that. But there are ways. There are techniques that we develop to obfuscate, to to go around, to circumvent the will of God and do it in a righteous way. We tend to drag our feet sometimes when we sense what God is doing. And God is interested. You know, that, and I think I've shared this, but this is just, this is mind-blowing to me. Maybe, maybe you've never heard this, but the whole concept we've been studying in, in this Prophecies of Hope, we went back to creation. And the whole idea that everything, everything that you see or will ever see in this earth, what you see or you might experience through the telescopes in the universe, and you see all of this, all of that God made. God made it all. And he did it in six days. God has been working on this lump of clay for over 30 years. And I have to say, what is wrong with me? If God can make the universe in six days, why why is he spending so much time on me? It isn't because he lacks the ability. It isn't that God lacks the power. It's to some degree or another, God has to work with the clay. And some clay is pliable and some is hard. And he knows our breaking point. He knows how far and how much and all of that. I want to get to the place where I want to be completely surrendered in the hand of the potter. Wouldn't you like to do that? To let God do his best work. To not fight the clay. I mean, that's what some potters will tell you at the beginning. They have to fight the clay. They have to, they have to you know, they just fight it. Because it doesn't want to bend, and it doesn't want to be molded, and it doesn't want to move. It likes being a lump of clay. And some of us are like that in life. We like being the way that we are. As ugly as we are. But God keeps looking down and saying, but I could do something so great with you. But God will never force his way. What is that song that we sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord? Have Thine Own Way. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me. Make me. After thy will. What does he say? Waiting, yielded, and still, or something like that. That's what we have to do. That's our part. We have to yield. We have to be still. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like the lump of clay that jumps off the potter's wheel. The God begins to do a little work, and then I jump off, and I want to go do something, and I want to experience something, and, I, and I'm happy with what God has done. But God is not done with me, and nor is he done with you. So friends, let me tell you something very important about the Christian life. The Christian life isn't just about going to church. It isn't just about hearing sermons. It isn't just about reading the Bible. It isn't just about praying. It isn't just about giving your tithe or even sharing your faith. It isn't about those things. Those things are not bad things, but those are not what being a Christian is all about. What I have learned and what my hope is for me and my hope for this body of believers is that we realize church is about transformation. It is about change. I've never understood why some people come to Christ with this attitude, I'm not changing. I mean, we may not say it that way, but we resist it in any and every way. God will take me just the way I am, and that is true. That is true. But he isn't going to leave me there. He loves me too much. But yet we have this attitude, take me the way I am, leave me alone, and let me just enjoy the things of God. 
Christian life is about transformation. That's the work that God is doing in your life. And here's, here's what I've known. Here's what I've observed through watching God work in other people's lives. It takes a long time for us to get to the place where we're, where we're done in life, where we're ready for heaven. And God does some of his best work right at the end. It is a process by which God works our whole life, but he knows the end of our life. He knows what it's going to take to bring us to that place. And you and I need to surrender to that. We need to trust that, that the work of God is good and right, and therefore we can claim that promise that all things will work together for good, that God has a vision for what it is he's trying to do in your life. Trust that. Trust the potter. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? You know what he's saying? I've got things covered. I know what I'm doing. God knows you know what you're not. God knows you don't know what you're doing. Let me say it that way. You know what? We, we live life by the seat of our pants. We go here, we go there, we're nimble, we're quick. We allow the circumstances to dictate our life. But we are not to be blown about by those surface winds when the deep currents of God have a plan and a purpose to move us in his direction. And so God's got it covered. You can trust him. And what he's saying is, you're the clay and I am the potter. Why are you questioning me? Don't question God. Surrender to God and allow God to do his work. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. You and I are in the hands of God. There is no safer place. There is no better place. That's where you and I are this morning if you are surrendered to God's will. If you're surrendered today and you live your life in that posture of being surrendered to God, this is what God wants for you. It's in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. One of my favorite verses. In fact, the New Living Translation says it this way. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he had planned for us long ago. We are God's masterpiece. Do you feel like God's masterpiece? When you woke up this morning and you looked in the mirror, did you look like God's masterpiece? Did you feel like God's masterpiece? Now he's saying, Pastor, I hear what you're saying, but I don't feel like God's masterpiece. But you are. He's just not done. A potter is still at the wheel. God's reputation is at stake because every artist is always judged by his art. Right? When you see a crummy piece of pottery, you think, what in the world? Didn't the person know what they were doing? And then you find out it was a four-year-old, and all of a sudden, oh, what a great thing. It's a masterpiece. God will be judged by his work. And God says before he's ever done, you are my masterpiece. Close your eyes, if you would. And hear the voice of God. You are my masterpiece. I created you to be an example of my greatest work. You are special. You were created in my image. I am not done with you. I am still at the wheel of your life. 
when I am done, you will be an example of my greatest work. You are my masterpiece. You know, when an artist finishes his masterpiece, I can only imagine what it must be like being an uncreative guy like I am. But I, vis- I kind of envision this, that he steps away, or she steps away, from the potter's wheel, or the kiln, or the canvas, and steps back and takes it in. And if it's truly a masterpiece, I've got to believe that there's got to be a huge smile on the face of the artist, a sense of pride in what they've done. I know it's hard for you to believe that God would ever feel that way about you, but he will, and he does. Because the amazing thing about our God is he doesn't focus with the way you are right now. I'm told that a good artist always sees the end from the beginning, that they keep adding paint to the canvas until it matches what they envision in their mind. I can imagine the same way with the potter. They see the finished work, and so they mold and shape and cut and squeeze the clay until it reflects the image they have in their mind. You are God's masterpiece. You and I are God's long-term project. The promise of God is he'll never give up. He that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. All you've got to do, all you got to do is stay yielded. If you and I will stay yielded, what is it that our God cannot do in your life? It will amaze you. And it will amaze all of the universe one day. I can't wait to get to heaven to see what God has done in your life. To see the power and the glory of the one who made you into what you are. I love that. There's going to be a lot of people surprised what God did in Pastor Bill's life. What God was able to do to Bill and Laurie and Robin and everybody. That's the way it is. So today as we come to a close, I want to ask you, would you be willing to trust God, to know that he's still at work, and would you be willing to keep yourself yielded? Don't give up on God. Don't become impatient. Don't get in all a huff. But just surrender and wait on God to finish the work when it is done. I know you will be God's masterpiece. Would you be willing to do that? I want to invite you to stand, if you will. Nobody gets excited about half-finished projects. You know what I'm talking about. God never gives up. So you don't either. Father in heaven, as we stand at the close of this message, we are reminded well, that we are clay. How appropriate that is. You've told us from dust we are, that we were molded, fashioned from the dust of the earth. He breathed into us the breath of life, and we became a living being. Father, here we are, trying to make sense of life. Oh, Lord, we can relate to this story, probably not in the way that we framed it, but we know what it's like to be sitting as a lump of clay spinning out of control. And we're thinking to ourselves, what is going on? Remind us, Lord, that the hands, the hands of our God are firmly fastened around us. That there is nothing that's going to happen to that clay that does not pass through the hands of the potter. Thank you for that protection. 
Thank you for that promise. And Lord, we believe in the promises of God, and so we claim that we are that work in process, that you will continue to work until the end of our days. I pray that everyone here standing today will, will be firm in their commitment to stay yielded, to allow God's work in their life to whatever you have for us, whatever that picture, that image is. Lord, we want that. We want to be an example of your greatest work. And so we yield ourselves to you today, thanking you that you never give up. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming today. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath. I'm going to stay right here. If you're visiting today, I'd love to come and meet you, or you come up here and meet me. Uh, we have lunch for those that want to stay by. You'll hear about that in just a moment out in the foyer. But I hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you. And we'll see you later this week or next Sabbath.